Can you just confirm that you're able to see the shared screen, okay? I'm back. Hi, welcome. We're laying, I've just opened the um, room so people will be joining shortly. Um, can you just confirm that you're able to see the screen, the um, slide all, all right? Yes, I am. Okay, great. So I'll just do a quick introduction um, using this slide and then I'll take this down and you can put up thrice. Let me see who's possible to change. Welcome everyone, thank you for joining. Um, we'll get started in about uh, five minutes just to let a few more people, people join. I want there to be more light. <laughs> so I'm switching position, but this Sounds is my good. Perfect. Just let me know if it's too much lighting so I okay. can, so I can, no. is this good or it's dark? Uh, you, which one is of, better? I this think one? before, the, this may, the light from behind is making it harder to see your face, maybe before. Okay, so I'm going to, this is what I'm going to do. Hi everyone, thank you for joining. We'll get started in a few minutes here, just let a few more join. Um, we'll probably get started in about um, four minutes. This is better. Yes, that's perfect. Okay. Great. Let me clean my, my. <laughs> the screen. Yeah, that would do much better. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. My camera. And then um, when you're presenting, if you do want to turn your camera off, you, you'll have the ability to do that um, at the bottom of your screen. Okay. But that is up to you. Okay. Welcome everyone. Just give a few more minutes for people to join. Good, much better. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, perfectly. Okay, good. So we still have some people joining, so I'm just gonna give a few a few more minutes. Hi everyone, thank you for joining. Um, we'll get started in a couple of minutes, just letting a few more people join. Good afternoon, thank you for being here. Sorry, I'm seeing the chat box is disabled. Um, let me try. Can someone please confirm in the chat that it's able to work now?
Great, thank you. Thank you, thank you all for joining. Um, we'll just give maybe one or two more minutes to have a few people join and then um, start with introductions. Okay, well, I will go ahead um, and get started with introductions and I'm sure a few more people will come in um, before the presentation. But um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to lecture one of the Upgrade Oncology Digital Training for Nurses and Clinical Oncologists. Um, this training is brought to you in partnership with Project Pink Blue and BioVentures for Global Health and funded by the ACT Foundation and the Nigerian Federal Ministry of Health. Um, my name is Caitlin Bishop. I represent BioVentures for Global Health, and I'll be helping to navigate you all through the remainder of this program. We're really pleased to virtually welcome everyone um, to today's meeting. And although we cannot all be together in person, um, I really do encourage you to share some photos of yourself or your colleagues, um, just capturing how you're each watching this, this webinar and this training. Uh, it's always really great to see the various settings in which our participants are able to fit these educational programs into their, their busy schedules. Um, so I'll be following up with an email where you're welcome to submit the photos and we'd greatly appreciate your contribution if you would like. Um, before starting the presentation, I just wanna go over a couple of brief Zoom etiquette um, rules. We ask that you please keep your video turned off and your microphone muted. Um, this will just help to preserve internet bandwidth and ensure a smoother lecture. If you have any questions throughout the lecture, please submit them through the chat box or the Q&A, which should now be um, functional. And those are both at the bottom of your screen. And I will share your questions um, with Omatara at the end um, of the lecture session. Um, we will be recording this session and all subsequent sessions in this program. Um, and the slide deck and recording will both be um, shared with you after, after today's session. Uh, we will also be posting the recordings to our course YouTube page, and I'll be sharing that link with everybody after today's session as well. Um, and if you need help operating Zoom or having any issues during the session today, please send myself um, a private message in the chat. Okay, um, and now it is my pleasure to welcome our presenter for today, Omatara Edelal. Um, Omatara is an advanced practice provider at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. She graduated from Rutgers University with her bachelor's and master's degrees in nursing, specializing in family health nursing practice, and is double board certified. She also holds a master's degree in global public health. She's been in practice for about two decades and in the oncology field for over a decade. Um, and she previously worked on the acute care oncology units as a clinical nurse. Currently, she practices in the pre-anesthesia clinic at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And she is currently enrolled in Wilmington University, Delaware, where she is set to graduate with her doctorate degree in nursing with a practice focus in the summer of this year. Um, Omatara is Nigerian American with an ancestral heritage in Lagos, Nigeria. So we're really excited to have her here today and to hear from her. Um, so Omatara, I will go ahead and take my screen down and you can go ahead and share your screen. Can I start? Perfect. Yes, and go ahead. Good and morning, everyone. My name is Omotara Adewale. As Kathleen introduced me, 
I'll be um, giving a lecture today on counseling patients prior to chemotherapy. And um, let's start. So that's um, the front slides. Okay, so the outline today we'll be discussing. Can you all see my screen? Yeah, okay. The yes, outline, yeah, the outline today we'll be discussing are um, assessments and education prior to chemotherapy, collaborative care. Oh, three people raised their hands. Let me see what's going on. Hold on. Is everything? I will, yes, I will just ask that if you have any questions to so please put them in the chat or the Q&A at the bottom and that way we can, um, I will share them with Avatara at the end of the lecture. Oh, okay. So you, you so, can go ahead and I'll keep track of them. Okay, so everyone can, I just want to make sure everybody sees my screen. That's why yes. I stopped the video. Okay, yes. so assessment and education prior to the onset of chemotherapy treatment, collaborative care, quality of life assessments, financial toxicity, oncofertility and reproductive counseling, sex and cancer, perception of side effects of, you know, some countries refer it to as toxicity. Um, perception of side effect of toxicity, discussing care diagnosis um, with children and loved ones, spiritual and religious care during treatment, then nutrition and cancer care. Okay. So let, okay. So in assessment of patients, um, the nurses actually do play a huge role in patient assessments at the onset of visits. Um, when the patient is diagnosed, they come to the provider. Usually what we do at Sloan Catering, a lot of these um, patients go through, you know, series bef before they see the provider, they have to go through financial clearance. So the first visit with the provider, which is usually the clinical oncologist or the, surg um, the um, surgeon, um, they evaluate the patient, discuss treatment options with the patient and um, patient education. And when um, an area of deficit is identified, patients are referred. So what we do here is we actually have a robust system of inter interdisciplinary team. So during the first visit with the patients, what the nurses do is uh, we have a very comprehensive nursing assessment. Um, and in this nursing asset assessment, we use, uh, we integrate eye validity screening tools um, to help assess um, if the patient would need any collaborative care. So what, um, what we use is um, our notes our notes that we um, used to assess the patient at the onset of visit and um, at intervals have in, um, integrated artificial intelligence enabled clinical decision support. So um, this are helps with EHR mediated workflow. What this does is, um, is generate automatic order sets. So most of our notes, especially the nursing notes, the very initial first visit, as um, screening tools incorporated. I'm gonna talk about a few of the screening tools later on. We have screening tools incorporated to identify if the patients are at risk. And we do make referrals based on their scores. So when a patient scores high, low, or zero, you know, it, it automatically generates an order set. So I'm sure many of you are aware, uh, familiar with the CDS, the clinical decision support, um, used to populate automatic orders based on the, you know, the patient um, score. So it automatically populates these order sets and they are picked up by the inter interdisciplinary team and executed. For example, um, when the patient comes, the first initial visit um, note um, by one of our oncology nurses, we assess the patient's employment status to identify toxicity risk. And when the score is high, it automatically populates another set and the, financial, the um, fin finance department picks it up as the patient is identified for financial toxicity. That's just one of them. We have others which identifies if the patient is gonna be at risk for suicide, depending on their scores. And this automatic goes to the psychiatry department. And we have others which identify if the patient is gonna need social work referral 
if they're going to need a great support system in coping, if they have poor coping mechanism, at risk for poor coping mechanism, it goes to social work departments. So these orders are picked up by the interdisciplinary team, and we all work together collaboratively, collaboratively. Um, so we have a robust support system with the patient um, for the patient. So the first, which I'll be talking about, you know, I'll be talking about collaborative care, depending on the patient's mental status, um, based on the assessment identified by the clinician, the clinical oncologist, and their nurses, or the nurse practitioners, or physician assistants, we will refer the patient for, to the psychologist or psychiatrist. And here is the reason why. Um, usually, we, as we all know, depressive symptoms and even anxiety affects quality of life and can affect the treatment. It should definitely affect the patient's treatment compli um, compliance to treatment. And um, this is very important for patients to be able to complete their treatment. Uh, patients who are very depressed or who are, you know, we've seen several studies showing how anxiety directly affects um, um, cancer treatments. Uh, so we do make sure patients are referred to um, the service they need. So we collaborate with the integrative medicine, integrative medicine we use for patients. We have patients who are so, you know, who believe in holistic care, who take herbs. So we, if we, if the patient shows up to us, they're gonna be starting chemotherapy and they take like 20 something different types of vitamins. We're not gonna tell them to stop. We don't want to, uh, our care to be perceived as judgmental because we have to address the patient as a whole. So we refer to integrative medicine, they'll discuss. And most of our, you know, our um, clinicians are very trained in oncology. They are, they're knowledgeable. Um, social work department, our palliative department, even our, you know, across the board, they are knowledgeable. We have pastoral care that are knowledgeable about cancer treatment. And when we refer patients for spiritual counseling, patients are able to open up to this count. Um, to, most times they are like pastors or reverend or rabbi, depending on their um on their preference, we ask the patient their preferences. We refer them um, and they, you know, discuss treatment options. Patient, we open up uh, about their fears. Most times, patients are able to open up more to their um, pastors, to religious um, councils about their fears, things they are not able to share with us, sometimes they share with them. And you know, they're we're able to collaborate care for the patient. We refer to palliative service, sexual health and fertility specialist. We also refer patients who have chronic um, comorbidities, we refer to specialists because it's important for patients adherence, for example, to their antihypertensive if they're gonna be going on chemotherapy. Some of these chemotherapies are toxic um, to the heart, you know, so it's important for patients to, uh, for this patient, we have patients, we have very sick population, we see very, very sick population of patients, so we collaborative care for the patients, depending on the patient's needs. Social work, social work plays a very important role, an important role in the care of our patient population. They have a support group, they are really the team that pauses and look at the patient as a whole. That when the patient comes to us, we do provide a lot of resources to the patient. Oftentimes in my clinic, when they come to us for pre-surgical testing, pre-anesthesia evaluation, the patients break down. They break down because they are overwhelmed with the um, treatment options provided to them. They want to do this treatment, but they think they cannot go through it. A lot of it is social, so it has to do with social needs and a lot of knowledge deficits. Some fear, some are very fearful. So the social work department will reach out to them, let them know they are not alone. We have resources here to help them through treatment. So social work department have support groups, parenting guidances, bereavement support. And we also provide support to caregivers and their families, you know, because the patient is not receiving treatment alone. We got to think about everything that makes up the patient. We got to think about, you know, the um, factors that might affect them coming to treatment, following through treatment. If the patient, for example, if the patient is the sole caregiver in the home, receiving treatment may affect their finances. And also, for example, 
if the patient is the one who cooks for the home. So this will change because they will have to, depending on the kind of treatment they're receiving, um, they may have to change their diet. So we have to look at all this collaboratively to make sure the patient complies with treatment without feeling overwhelmed. So the most important, the first and the foremost is the quality of life. Mm -hmm. The quality of life of the patient has to be assessed at the onset of treatments and at intervals. So we look at their perception, we assess their perception in life, in the context of cultures, values, what makes up the patient as it relates to their goals, their expectation, what, they, what do they really need? We look, at, we look at the effect of disease treatment on their aspect of life. We listen to the patient, let them express what their fears are. And um, we, first of all, we try to ensure we have a trusting relationship where the patient are able to you know, open up. Um, we assess all aspects of their life as it relates to their health. So during chemotherapy treatment, as we know, the patient's um, perception can be altered. And this really affects their health-related quality of life's per perception, ultimately decreasing their functional status. So assessment and evaluation of the patient's health-related quality of life is very important. It's a very important measure to see how these treatment side effects will impact their life. On their, on their disease perception, psychological issues, life satisfaction, and patients' overall well-being. It's actually, um, we know some treatments, every time a patient hears about the cancer diagnosis, the diagnosis itself, it elicits fear on a lot of patients. To some, they see it as a death sentence, especially to our population of Nigerians. You know, a lot of them have anxiety, fear, of body image disturbance, fear of sexual related problems. So these tools is used to assess the patient's risk. We also have social determinants of health, of the quality of life. This is the more non-medical aspects which are usually overlooked. It's one of the three priorities area for our early people 23 goals. It's the major driver of health cost and outcome. We see how this affects our patients' outcomes with treatment and the cost. Um, it affects how they live, their access to quality health care, level of education, occupation, um, health care disparities, income, and gender and age affects this. So we assess their social aspects. We use a multidisciplinary and multi-level approach to um counter this quality of life goals um there are forces that shape the condition of daily life low and low social and emotionally functioning are associated with psychological variables and this influences how patient relates to their family and participate in social activities so we need to uh, um, assess this so i'll be talking about assessment of the quality of life prior to treatment the tools that we most clinicians use so we use the functional assessment of cancer. The, usually with us here in Sloan, these tools are incorporated into the initial nursing assessment prior to the initiation of chemotherapy treatments. Oftentimes the nurse who will be administering the, the chemo team or the immunotherapy team assess the, the um, you know, it's part of their um, assessment notes, their structured notes. So we, um, Evidence-based quality of life assessments are used to optimize the patient's care. When we identify a need, we refer the patient to the department that will help them address these needs. So we implement this into our, um, into our practice, but you know, it remains a challenge for a lot of people because treatment impacts quality of care. So we have to be very careful when we are addressing, is this really the side effect of treatment or really the patient's baseline? So decline may occur during treatment, um, the, in, during treatment, improvement of quality of care and well-being during treatments will benefit the patient. So, you know, many times it's really hard, but based on the resources available for the patient, we are able to minimize the side of adverse effects and we Im implement strategies to improve their quality of life. We have to understand the patient and family's goals in um, caring for the old person. We have to consider their perception of cancer treatment and side effects. 
we have patients from different backgrounds um, based on you know cultural beliefs and um, cultural um, um, spiritual background based on their religious belief. So we have to tailor strategies to individual patients' needs. We have to pay special attention to the potential issues that may India their adjustment to post treatment. So we screen patients for systemic thera um, therapy side effects and use symptom scales. Um, we address their physical functioning, emotional and social functioning. So um, I'll give you a little example. Um, with our Nigerian population, we can we have to um, look at the patient as a whole. So I had a, a close person to me, a family member who was diagnosed with she was she, um, postmenopausal bleed. This was about 10 years ago. I remember her vividly telling me the doctor told her to come get a DNC and for her to be assessed and endometrial biopsy may be done. If she has any abnormal cells, it will advise her to have a total hysterectomy, consider total hysterectomy so to avoid problems later on. This was 10 years ago. The patient said to me, oh, no, I'm not listening to you. And she's a postmenopausal woman. She was around 60 at that time. She said to me, no, I'm not listening to the doctor. Who is he to tell me about taking out my womb? And she's a, she's a Nigerian-American who has lived in the country for over 20 years. She looked me dead in the face and said to me, oh, I'm not going to take out my womb. Because if I get reincarnated, I don't want to be womb, wombless and childless. And this is a woman who I consider not to be illiterate. She's not illiterate. She has some level of literacy. So 10 years later, let's talk about it. Now she's diagnosed with endometrial cancer, high-grade endometrial cancer. She has to go through chemotherapy, possibly radiation therapy. Of course, she didn't have this can um, cancer 10 years ago. but if she had taken the advice of the doctor, we won't be having this conversation today. And eventually she will end up needing the hysterectomy. So I think if we had um, done a little bit more work on this patient 10 years ago, um, we won't be having this conversation about a new diagnosis today. I feel like we probably failed this patient. She's not a patient at me of Memorial Sloan Catering. This is a patient I know from the community. So I couldn't do much for her at that time. She was referred to me through a family member. So um, we oftentimes come across this kind of patients and it's important for us to see the patient as a whole in order to address their risk factors and to prevent um, problems like this. So let's talk about addressing financial toxicity. We all know cancer care is one of the most expensive or care conditions. Um, most patients, who have cancer diagnosis have, have expressed concerns about them having financial distress, the distress throughout their yeah, treatment costs. I know Nigerian's healthcare system is definitely different from the United States healthcare system, but across the board, anywhere in the world, cancer treatment is expensive. There has to be someone to absorb the costs, either the health insurance or the patient. And most times here in the US, we have a, you know, we have health insurance for um, many people who have health insurance. Most people um, have health insurance. Let me put it out. And patients that don't have health insurance, we have something called charity care in some of our hospital system. So in a system in Nigeria without um, universal health care coverage, the average cost of treatment, for example, I looked at this study by Knapp et al., the average cost of um, breast cancer treatment resulted in a catastrophic healthcare expedition of about 95%. So we assess the patient's um, financial distress in our initial nursing, nursing assessment notes. Um, financial distress has shown to, the, to affect uh, a patient's quality of life. So it's shown to, studies have shown that it has decreased quality of life when patients think about how much money they have to spend on their cancer treatment and not being able to care for the family. You know, it affects them psychologically. And most times they abandon their treatments. Many people give up. 
So data from 20, 20, 20, 2007 to 2020 shows that financial toxicity among cancer patients in low and middle income countries like Nigeria varies from 17.73 to 93.38%. So we use um, that, um, tools with high validity to measure their financial toxicity here in the US, in my hospital in Sloan, uh, we are addressed and it goes automatically when patients cause I, that other sort of score is um, score, the financial toxicity screening tool other um, score generates another set. And this goes to the finance department and also the social work department. And usually the social work department will reach out to the patient to have a talk with them about what's going on. And we have um, resources in the community. Are they a candidate for Medicaid insurance? They try to get them insurance and other resources available in the community. So here are ex examples of standardized instruments used um, in high income countries to assess patients' financial toxicity risk. So we have one which is specific to breast cancer. We have others, but the most popular of them all is the cost facet. So this cost um, FACIT um, is used in most places to identify financial toxicity if the patients cost less than 26. Then we determine their risk the risk factors. Usually the mild score is 14 to 25, moderate about one to 13 and severe is zero. So depending on this here in the, in the US, we refer them for um, maybe charity care or financial. the finance department, we see what we can do for them. So um, I'm not sure if we have any tool used in Nigeria to assess their financial toxicity, but from the little um, I, you know, I know from the little resources I was able to look up, um, uh, most of these patients when they come for treatment and they are told that about the treatment cost, a lot of them will abandon the treatment and tr and seek other measures like maybe traditional options. Um, integrative medicine options that are not based on research and evidence. So a lot of them, we abandon this, um, their treatment um, and won't come back. So I looked at this study by Levitt et al to see how they were able to counter this in um, one, of, uh, the, um, one of the low and middle income countries. I think that was in Bra no Mexico or Brazil. So they were able to come up with measures to decrease travel distances to where the patient would, would be receiving cancer treatment. They were able to re um, reduce financial burdens using resources available in the community when the insurance cover um, coverage is limited or the patient have no ins insurance coverage. So they were also able to have these patients connect them to pre clinical trial participation. Most of their rural residents, they were given the you know given the resources available to clinical trial participation in their in different areas of the country, so they could get their treatment for free. I know Nigeria has this system in place when you know where patients are able to participate in clinical trials and the treatments are often free. So this country was also able to partner with providers and community leaders to address the local gaps in LK. They were able to open, you know, to get resources, donations through their to, from their community leaders to provide care for patients without health insurance or limited health insurance. So we use measures to address, we use these measures to address the structural failing in the LK system contributing to healthcare disparity. So this is something we may want to consider in Nigeria um, to, um, to address gaps in healthcare for our oncology population. So the next topic is going to be oncofertility and reproductive counseling. So according to the American Society of Clinical Oncology, it is recommended that every provider should address the possibility of infertility among patients seeking, um, seeking treatment, young patients of childbearing age seeking treatment. And this has to be done earlier in their treatments before the onset of chemotherapy. There's like these guidelines and recommendation by ASCO. There've been barriers about um, barriers affecting the initiation. 
and these barriers are due to lack of provider and patient awareness about fertility preservation options. Um, most providers do not have um, access to facilities that offer these services. Significant disparities in the perception of contraception and fertility counseling has also affected this because um, it, patients have different beliefs. Race is an important factor of quality of perceived counseling. Here, based on many um, studies, we found that Caucasians are more likely to perceive receipt of fertility counseling than African-Americans. Gender, men are more likely than women to perceive fertility counseling, to perceive and pursue fertility, uh, fertility counseling. So delaying diagnosis with insufficient time for referral to reproductive specialists before treatment is also a factor. Financial burden on the patient is a factor. So I was made to understand that most of the fertility um, um, centers in, in Nigeria really focus on, they're focused more on IVF treatment. Um, and so this poses a challenge to the patient because a patient may want to freeze their eggs, but they don't have the resources available for them to freeze their legs or even bank their sperm. So this is an area that you we may want to discuss with um, investors in the community to, I know, it's becoming very popular, especially here in the US, where investors that have no healthcare background are investing in healthcare facilities. So this may be an area that we want to discuss with investors in the community. We, you know, we have we lack this. This is a gap in healthcare that needs to be bridged. And we need centers for um, egg freezing for our patients to be affordable for them and also spend banking. And of course, it's not covered by insurance, especially among the underserved population. So here in the US, we are, um, it's now becoming uh, covered by insurance. Egg freezing option is now uh, become, but the patient still has to come up with a, a, a percentage, out of pocket percentage. So we have to probably lobby and advocate for insurance um, systems in Nigeria to cover um, spam banking and egg freezing for patients, um, especially young patients seeking cancer treatment in their childbearing age. So we, as we all know, logistic, culture, and religious and ethical obstacles are a huge barrier. Most patients do not believe in that and will not pursue that. So prior to the initiation of treatment, we got to counsel the patients about this, make education ma material available for the patient. Although most times when the patient comes to us, they have advanced cancer and the goal is to start the treatment right away in order to, for, for the goal of tumor debulking and treatment. But we have to look at the patient, pause and look at the patient as a whole make these resources available for the patient and allow patients to make informed decision. So here are the options for oncofertility counseling and successful fertility preservation treatment. So we have the recommended spy, uh, sperm car preservation. Um, ASCO, ASCO has identified that this is underutilized despite its recommendation by the American Academy of Pediatric Guidance. So we have to avoid impairment of gonadial function due to treatment, encourage sperm banking in our young men, like I said earlier. Oocyte and cryopreservation and embryo preservation is, is something that is upcoming based on technologies. I'm not sure if we have these resources in Nigeria, but we have to let the female survivors know they have a chance to have their, this will give them a chance to have their biologic children after cancer. It's shown to be successful with evidence of safety. So this is something maybe um, a project can be developed and partnership with the fertility centers in Lagos and Abuja. It's becoming very popular. I see a lot of, even from the US, a lot of young Nigerian women from the US and Canada who's tried several IVF treatments here in the US and Canada. 
and have failed, I've seen them go to Nigeria to seek these treatment options and they've been successful. I had a, how old was she? 62 year old, family friend, had twins. And she also had um, the twin, she ended up giving a twin, the twin a sibling at 63. And this woman prior, um, came to the US previously, saw a doctor that I recommended. And um, the doctor had, that was, this was when she was 55. She had suffered a miscarriage after like 27 high years. But you know, in Abuja, they were able to successfully deliver her. She's healthy, her kids are healthy, no problems. So that means they have advanced technologies in these centers. So maybe if they, they ask, uh, you know, clinicians can put together a project, partner with these centers and find stakeholders um, to address this gap in healthcare. So there are other experimental options, testicular and ovarian tissue cryopreservation. Fewer patients may elect to cryopreserve embryos, maybe because of the cost and because they may think um, religious, it may be religious beliefs or cultural beliefs. So there are other options such as adoption and use of donor gametes. We can you know, inform the patients about this option. And we, shall, we should also educate them about the post-treatment risk about when um, stem banking, long-term impact on the ability to conceive such as azospermia and stem chromosomal abnormality leading to potential increased teratogenicity of offspring with genetic mutation, even if the sperm production recovers. So these are the sperm banking, um, the risk of not using the sperm banking. If the patient do not bank their sperm, we have to educate them about the post-treatment risk. So I see some people who raised, I, I, I thought I saw some hands raised. Anybody has a question? I will, hello? If anyone, if anyone has a question, I would ask that you please add it to the chat box at the bottom. It can be a bit challenging um, to have people unmute with such a large group. If you oh. could try and add to the Q&A or the chat box and we'll be happy to share with Amatara. Thank you. Oh, okay. Somebody, oh, thank you so much. Timia Ataman said in RSA, most medical insurance companies do cover for patients diagnosed with life-threatening disease to donate their sperm and egg freezing prior to cytotoxic treatment. Impressive. Yeah. Do we have this in Nigeria among our healthcare? Let me see. In RSA, we do support patients financial. We do get, what country, where is heresy? Sorry. Okay. So I was just reading the questions. Thank you so much for this information. Tinia Hackerman, thank you. I sent you a question. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to continue. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next topic will be is percep perception of side effect and um, toxicity. I think. Hold on one second. No, sex and cancer. So usually we, um, this is a huge topic, it's a huge topic because most of us clinicians are not educated to talk to patients about sex and cancer. Um, of, you know, the GYN department does a very good job and neurology department, they do a very good job in that because of the knowledge they have. So studies have shown that 11.5 million cancer survivor, among, um, among 11.5 million cancer survivor, 87% of them have experienced sexual side effect. It affected their libido, ejaculation function, discomfort, anxiety, confidence, organic, organs, make pain, and all other real issues. All these issues are real. So according to what these um, oncologists have perceived, they've perceived that men are more open to talk about sex and cancer than women. Men are more open to talk about it prior to the onset of treatment. Women 
more than women. Women open, open up later on in treatment about their discomfort. So these videos I found on MSKCC website, I'm not gonna um, start them because they're about 30 minutes long, but I will recommend and um, you know recommend for everyone to watch these videos. They're very good videos. They were put together by Dr. Diane Reedy, one of our oncologists in partnership with um, experts in that field. So they talked about the, you know, how people have perceived it, reported it, and how they've been able to overcome the obstacles. So I will really, you know, I would recommend for these videos to be what they're about 24 minutes each. That's about a total of an hour. So I'm just gonna move to the slide. It's important um, to the next slide. It's important for clinicians to have this talk about the patient, refer them accordingly, refer to the experts in the field. So the next is perception of side effect and toxicity. So perception of side effect of the likelihood of toxicity and expected symptoms, it all boils down to um, the education, the patient as a whole. I'll say the patient as a whole because most patients, no matter how much the doctor sits down and talks to them, patients will still go out in the community and hear from every single person that has no knowledge about cancer. That's why the fact that the trained and the skilled clinician who works and makes recommendations based on what evidence I've shown, I've told them their treatment option. These patients, depending on their social circle and their coping, this, you know, the mechanism they use for coping, they still go into the community and have discussions from people. And when patients come to me at, you know, to us, to my clinic and the bring up this topic and here is what I tell them. Don't discuss your cancer diagnosis with people who have no knowledge about the treatment options available. The treatment options that has been presented to you by your oncologist or your surgeon are based on what they've, they've, they, they do this every day based on evidence, based, based on evidence, based on research, based on treatment that they've done on patients and has been successful. So communication should focus on treatment goals alongside expected risk. Patients should be educated on what is expected. Every chemo treatment has its own side effects. Patients should have a flyer provided to them with what's expected and what may happen. So to reduce misperception and improve informed choices by the patient. When the patient knows their side effect, their, it calms them down. It lets them make informed decision. They know what to expect and they know how to overcome it. So patient education and other sources of information leading to misinformation has contributed greatly to not just patient adherence to treatment in Nigeria, but all over the world. In the US, we deal with it too. We have, I had a patient, how many years ago I saw this lady, she came to Sloan, she was diagnosed with stage one breast cancer. She left Sloan Catering, went to our country to seek treatment. By the time she came back to us, she was already, she was a stage four. All that could have been avoided. All that could have been avoided. So patients need to listen to their doctors. I think it's all boiled down to, um, building a trust, that first person, this is what patients have told me, the first person they meet here in Sloan when they come makes a huge difference in how they're gonna receive, receive the treatment option presented to them. The first, maybe oncologist or surgeon, how they perceive the doctor and the nurses in that clinic will um, actually affect their adherence to treatment. So patients need to be knowledgeable about the, what's expected of them. So I looked at this study by Abdul Salam. It's how it's revealed that 97.0 oh, patients in Nigeria get their resources from 73.5% of them get it from doctors, about 409 from nurses, 327 from the internet. The biggest problem we have is Dr. Google. A lot of people go to Google and find information that has no business, things that, ha that doesn't apply to them. And they, you know, pick up on these things and make a big deal out of it. Many of them talk to their peers who have no knowledge. I tell patients, cancers are usually not the same just because you have a cousin with a breast cancer, you may not have the same kind of cancer. So if the doctor offered your cousin just lumpectomy without, maybe with hormone therapy, 
and you come into Sloan and they're offering you chemo first to debulk your tumor. No two cancer is the, 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 uh, the same. It has, depends on your staging and the type of the cancer you have. So in this study by Abdul Salam et al, it was noted that patients who are younger and who are employed had an increased likelihood of knowledge of chemotherapy toxicity. Does it mean that younger patients are listing more to the patient or to the doctors when they're talking to them or maybe because um, they're educated? Does education play a big role in this? Probably. So at the end of the day, it boils down to building a trusting relationship with the patient, identifying their risk factors. At the beginning of their visit, on the first day of visit, the, um, what patient perceives um, plays a big role. Educate the patient on the likelihood of toxicity, what to expect, and how they can overcome this. So, um, the next topic is discussing cancer diagnosis with children. So, usually with this, um, we come across this a lot. We come up, this is very common, this is very popular. But one thing I know it have identified um, among our Nigerian population is some people hide cancer diagnosis from their children. This happened, I'm talking about real life, it happened to my mother. So that's why the fact I walk in Sloan and at this time my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer, I was working on the women's health floor, taking care of patients with breast cancer. And my mother had the audacity <laughs> to want to hide her diagnosis from me. Yes, she did. And this is a woman with, with a PhD degree, very well educated. So thank God my mother, my sister that was living with my mom at this time, she was able to go, she overheard a conversation talking to someone somewhere that they told her she had breast cancer and she did not believe she had breast cancer. So I jumped, you know, immediately my sister called me. I had a heart to heart talk with my mother and thank God she's now 10 years in remission. You know, it was a stage one breast cancer. She was able to get up, surgery, um, a surgeries. Then she had a radiation and new adjuvant treatments and she's fine, thank God. So effective communication with the patient enhances coping mechanism in the home and prepares for what lies ahead. Most times patients are fearful of the impact of a diagnosis on the children. We encourage patients to communicate with their children. We do have workshops to assist healthcare um, professionals in communicating with parents and children about parental life-threatening condition. So I know when I was a nurse, I did, you know, clinical nurse, we have all these workshops that um, nurse managers will sign, up, sign us up for. Every year we had to attend we had um, paid days for learning, paid learning days that we had, which was mandated for us, and it's still mandated for us to attend this workshop. And one of these workshops actually addressed okay, how we as clinicians com communicate with parents and their children. And what, most times when we find a, a big problem, we identify um, a big problem, then we reach out to the social work departments because they do a very good job. They usually will in, in, um, invite the patient, uh, the, per, the, per, the patient and their children for a therapy section. So they have um, they, they have um, support groups where, uh, to help the patient overcome these barriers. So most times the patient may want to protect their children from the diagnosis through D2H and the children, um, or maybe the patient, the children may be young. So what we what we do is we communicate with the children based on their developmental understanding of illness. We use uh, age appropriate language to communicate with the children. We acknowledge emotional aspect and desire to protect the children if the patient wants it. But the truth is, children have active imagination and access to information. They have the internet. I will tell you something. Oh, my son, nine year old son, came to ask me about HIV. My son asked me about, he said, mommy, what's HIV? And why are there so many treatments on the TV and on YouTube about HIV? Children have access to information. So back in our days, there were a lot of conversation 
that our parents didn't have with us because of our age. But now these children have a lot of access on the internet to information and they do pay attention. They pay attention, they see what's going on. So I had a little health challenge last year and I bought a book about the challenge. So my two sons came to me and said, mommy, why do you have this book here? Are you sick? They're paying attention. That's not the fact we don't want these children to know because they're young. They know, they see you lose weight, they see you change your diet, they see you reading books, they see you taking medications. So it's important for, um, per, um, for parents to share their diagnosis with the patient. So we, um, as an institution, we should provide support to be parents' decision and let them know we will continue to work to them with, with them until they are ready to share their diagnosis. But it is encouraged that we encourage them to you know, involve their children, especially if it's an advanced stage cancer. Like I said earlier, children may notice the physical state of their parents losing weight, and they will, you know, they will ask questions. So when we address this situation with the um, with the children, it's important as clinicians to use open-ended questions to see, to address and assess their understanding. So you, you may want to say, uh, the child may say, oh, I noticed my mother is losing weight. Then using an open-ended question, we may say, what do you mean by open weight, uh, losing weight? So, and this will open up um, a whole canker worm of um, conversation. We want to provide privacy during discussion. The child may not be want to open up in front of the parent. If the child requests, can I speak to you privately? With the permission of the parent, we can ask, can I speak to your child privately and let hear what the child has to say? And it's important that the parents ask the children how much they know about this diagnosis and be truthful to the child. If, it's a, if the teacher don't look good, let your child know. So oftentimes we recommend therapy section for the parent. We have clinicians here, we have experts um, that do therapy section with parents and children. So according to Dalton et al, it, this has shown to be very helpful in communicating and coping with a new cancer diagnosis or advanced stage cancer diagnosis among the parents and, the children and their child. So this is the, oh yeah, this is my favorite topic, spiritual and religious care. It is my favorite topic because this is the biggest, in my own opinion, I don't know what evidence has shown in Nigeria. I don't know if there are studies out there. This is the biggest reason why we have such low compliance with chemotherapy treatment among the Nigerian population. Spiritual coping faith and faith correlates with the optimism and social support during treatment. Studies have shown that patients who have good fin who, who have a higher being they believe in have been successfully uh, have successfully been able to cope with their treatments because they receive support during this treatment and they have a higher being they believe in and this really helps them psychologically to pull through treatments. Therefore, it is important for us to integrate spirituality into clinical practice, but it can be very challenging due to different beliefs. We have different beliefs, <laughs> spiritual beliefs, depending on religion. You know, everyone has what they believe in and what, um, when it comes to cancer, how they're able to counter, uh, counter it. But this um, positively impacts a better physical health and mental health and lowers mortality. Patients who have better coping mechanism, and a belief in a higher being have shown to have lower mortality rates with cancer. So we, can, we, can, we should assess the patient's um, spiritual well-being. And this tool, the functional assessment of chronic illness, spiritual well-being skill is also used to. I know that when patients come to Sloan, part of the initial nursing assessment, we do have questions for them. And here is a question we asked out to, I have an example here with me. I'll read it out to you. For adults, we, have, we, we do an assessment based on their... So the first question is, uh, how is religion important to you? Oh, patients, okay. So how is spirituality practice believe um, important to you? How, do you? how will it affect your care? Then we ask them to describe it and whatever they say, we free type it into the box. Um, then we ask them, would you like your medical record 
to list your religion of faith. What's your religion of faith? We put in the assessment. Then we, we ask them to state the amount of strength, comfort they get from their religion or spirituality right now. And whatever it is, one of the options is all that they need. The second one says some was less what they need and the other one says none at all. And the next questions uh, will be, would you like a trained staff to provide spiritual support to contact you? If the person says yes, then it's automatically auto-population order in the, in the CIS system. And this order goes to, uh, we have a very robust chaplaincy pastoral care department and they go the, it goes into their department they pick up the order and they see what religion the patient requires desires so our pastoral care department and chaplaincy department we have everything we have a rabbi we have a reverend father we have reverend sister we have protestants we have different from different background religious background and they are trained they receive the same education about cancer care they, they have knowledge about it everyone goes for training every year depending on you know their area of specialty and i clearly be, i strongly believe that um when patients hear from someone who shares in their spiritual belief they feel better they're able to have better mechanism with their cancer and side effect treatment. We've seen it from time to time. Patient, I want to speak to my rabbi. I want to receive Holy Communion before my surgery. We make it available for them. The priest will be there before your surgery, between the, before the two hours cut to, to give you your Holy Communion. I want or to give you a blessing depending on the surgery. Most surgery, you cannot have anything to eat that morning. You have to be NPO. They'll give you their blessing. You can have your communion the day before, but not on the morning of surgery. It is important to have patient the spiritual care they prefer. Like I said earlier, I referred to the, the services. Studies have shown that spiritually inclined staff and nursing staff are more likely to ask patients about their spirituality. This study is actually true because um, if I have no knowledge about spirituality, I'm not going to have that conversation with my patient and we're not allowed to have the conversation with the patient. But if the patient do ask a question and request and based on our nursing assessments, the questions, the screening tool incorporated into our nursing assessment, depending on the score, they will make referral. If the patient says to me, if, oh, can I speak to my rabbi? Then we make referral. So we have to acknowledge the importance of spirituality in oncology care and refer accordingly. It's very important for patients' spirituality to be addressed during their treatment because these, um, these um, chaplaincy and pastoral care have knowledge and training about the disease. Process, treatment needed, and potential side effects can be discussed with the patient and how they can, you know, overcome it. So let's talk about nutrition. Nutrition is actually a big question, a, a big topic when it comes to cancer care because we have everyone who has what they think People should be eating and what they so many people oh i can't eat sugar i can't eat carbs i can't eat rice i can't eat yam because it has sugar i'm receiving cancer care but i don't know where they're getting their information from they go to a lot of resources it's important for them to talk to discuss with people who are, who are trained so i had a discussion with the director of nutrition in regards to this topic at a nutrition director here has known and you know she did recommend for me to show you all this video which i'll be showing at the end for sloan ketchup we have a very robust nutrition and cancer um department so we all know that medical nutrition therapy is essential to you know as an essential part of cancer care patients cannot starve their cell their body of whatever of whatever diet they want to starve their body of carbs but they may need carbs to survive so education should be included in the treatment packet let them know and you know what's unique about um cancer is uh, chemotherapy treatment and nutrition is every chemo has their side effects so we have diet plans um, designed by our trained registered nutrition and um, dietitian and nutritionists refer to the when we are when we know depending on their treatment that the treatment may affect their 
nutrition will be referred to these departments and the goal is to help the patient feel their best while managing treatment, comorbidity, side effect or weight changes. Many patients lose weight during cancer treatments. So educate patients on safe food handling and preparation, especially for patients going for transplant treatments. They will be very immunocompromised. Even our chemotherapy patients become very immunocompromised. So they want to talk about the use of multivitamins, mineral and herbs and every single herbs on that planet. They need to talk to integrative medicine specialists who are trained in oncology to know if this um, medication is safe to take while they're receiving cancer treatment. So we want to identify weight loss, weight gain. When a patient loses weight, certain kind of weight, we refer to nutrition department. Um, special and restricted diet, with, you know, the clinician, uh, the nutritionist talks to them about this and also recommended cancer risk re um, reduction. So I shared the link here, Memorial Stone Catering has this access for their patient population. So if you want to look at, if you want to look at that, that, as a very um, robust information. So nutrition depends on the type of setting, you know, type of chemo or radiation. If they are receiving an head, head and neck radiation, chemo radiation, it will definitely have nutritional impact. If they are receiving certain immunotherapy, most of them have, you know, most immunotherapy are tough on the gut because um, most chemotherapy are tough on the gut because we know that chemo targets fast growing cells and the GI lining, mucosa, it is fast growing, you know, fast, fast growing cells. So they will have side effects. So it over, overall affects the patient's health and nutrition status. So we have diet plans for people with cancer. I have a link here. Balancing healthy eating dietary needs and cultural practices. It also talks about, you know, patients who have all kind of um, dietary needs. If you are a vegetarian, due to your cultural practices, how you can balance your healthy eating and, you know, other things. We have a link here. But my uh, the next link is um, sugar and cancer friend or foe. So I'm going to play this video because I want all of us to hear from our oncologist, Dr. Rady. She interviewed uh, one of the specialists. And I think this video, uh, you know, I find this video to be very informative to combat um, our popular, the patient's popular myth about how sugar affects cancer treatment and tumor, tumor regrowth and tumor division. So I'm gonna click on this, let me see. So this is, we have a, um, I do recommend if you, I'm sure you're able to have access because this access is available to our patients. So it says Cancer Straight Talk podcast from MSKCC. It's most of the podcasts, all of them actually interviews with um, experts in that field and they're very knowledgeable. They're very knowledgeable. It gives the insight of people who actually have the first-hand information about this. So in this episode, Dr. Diane Reddy Lagons talks to medical oncologist Santosha Var. Anna, about sugar and cancer. What is our favorite food's metabolic role in cancer and treatment? So we're going to listen to this. It's been called cancer's favorite food and cancer. One question. Can you hear? Yes, that's perfect. Yeah, good. So it's best friend. Does the stuff in the white bowl cause cancer cells to grow? And is there a link between eating sugar and the development of cancers? Let's get into it. Hello. I'm Dr. Diane Reedy Lagune from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and welcome to Cancer Straight Talk. We're bringing together national experts and patients fighting these diseases to move forward evidence based conversation. Our mission is to educate and empower you and your family members to make the right decisions and live happier, healthier lives. For more information about the topics discussed here or to send your questions, please visit us at mskcc.org slash podcast. Today, I'm thrilled to have Dr. Santosh Vardana to address the link between sugar and cancer. Dr. Vardana is a physician scientist here at MSK. In the clinic, he cares for patients with lymphoma, but his research focuses on metabolism or how sugar or glucose is taken up by our cells and what happens when those cells are cancer. Santosh, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's really great. We're very excited to have you here. I think before we get into the concept of diet and sugar as it relates to what we eat, 
Can you just walk us through the sort of metabolism of a cancer cell? Meaning, what do cancer cells actually need to survive? And how do they actually get those nutrients? I think that's a great way to start. And maybe we can even take a step back from there and ask, what is metabolism and why should we even care about it? So metabolism refers to the process by which any cell or organ or organism like a person takes up nutrients and what purposes they use it for by breaking it down and turning it into other things. The reason that cancer cells do metabolism differently is that their goals are different. So if you think about all of our body's normal cells, they're mostly just trying to make energy to stay alive because you're a fully formed adult. You don't really need to make that many more cells. You have all the cells you need. So you just need to make energy to power your daily processes. But a cancer cell is trying to do something fundamentally different. The real goal of a cancer cell is not to just keep up. It's to make more of itself, specifically to double the total amount of stuff that makes up a cell so it can turn into two cells. One way that you can make more stuff is to just take up more stuff. So one of the primary transitions that a cancer cell makes when it decides to turn from a non-cancerous cell to a cancerous cell is to say, you know what, I'm going to take up as much sugar as I can, and I'm going to turn it into all the stuff I need to make new cells. And that explains a lot of things that we see in cancer. For anybody who's ever had a PET scan, that's just an imaging study, a CAT scan, except you are injected with a labeled version of sugar and the cancerous parts of your body light up because they're sucking up all that radioactive sugar. And it also tells us molecularly what's happening with cancer. So when you're talking about at this cancer level, which is fascinating, we know based from biology 101, that glucose breakdown can come from lots of things. It can come from a patient's muscle. It can come from lots of different things, not only the simple sugar. So the body can meticulously break down lots of different things through gluconeogenesis and other things to get that glucose. Is that correct? So that is correct. One way to think of it is like a cancer has got its foot on the gas and doesn't have a break. What that means is that it's going to do anything to grow and it's going to take up anything. It's going to use anything. So if there's sugar around, great. If there isn't sugar around, it'll take up fat or protein. We actually study this in the lab a lot. We deprive cancer cells of all different kinds of nutrients. And no matter what we deprive, eventually cancer will eat something else. Cancer cells will eat other dead cancer cells and turn it into fuel for themselves. They'll eat free protein. Whereas your immune system is like any other normal cell in your body. It's responding to like all the normal cues that your body has. So if you're starving, your immune system, like all your normal cells, is going to say, this is not a good time to make more of myself. So one of our fundamental challenges when we're trying to improve the immune system is how do we help our immune system fight a metabolic fight when the deck is stacked against us? Let's talk about diet. Let's do it. So the stuff in the white bowl got a bad rap, and we talked a little bit about that before, but we'll get down to it. Can it contribute to the development of cancer? And is it actually the sugar or is there something else going on there? The problem is that people who eat a lot more sugar, lots of other things going yeah, on. Yeah, they do a lot of other stuff that's not so great. That being said, here are a few things that we know. Cancer incidence tracks very closely with increases in body mass index and obesity as a surrogate for caloric intake. And if you drill down a little bit deeper and you look at the glycemic index, which is basically a measure of how easily the food that you eat can get turned into sugar. So the simpler, what we call it, more processed a food is, the higher a glycemic index it has. That is also associated with not only cancer, but these tend to be very specific types of cancer. So breast cancer, GI cancers, gastrointestinal cancers are definitely associated with that process. And the inverse is also somewhat true, which is that a high fiber diet, a diet that is high in complex carbohydrates, a kind of higher protein diet is associated with a relatively lower incidence of cancer. And so from the 30,000 foot view, those associations are there. And that makes sense. Like if you are a cell that happened to have acquired a mutation that tells it to gobble up a bunch of sugar, well, that 
one cell is going to turn way more easily into 10 cells if there's a lot of free sugar hanging around. And it's going to be a bit of a tougher barrier to get over if there's less sugar hanging around. So it's an observation that matches with a prediction, I guess. Right. So the suggestion is refined sugars, soft drinks with your Coke, your Sprite. Yes. The stuff in the white bowl, pure fructose, that type of sugar could easily get into the bloodstream, potentially to these cells in a way, again, observational, we see could potentially be worse than, for example, an apple. So that not all sugar is the same in terms of what's in a name. That's exactly right. And I think that the way that you stated it is also exactly right. So we would never refer to like taking in more sugar as the driver, because you're never going to turn something into a cancer without the mutation or the change in its genetics that makes it want to grow faster. But if the pantry's full, it's a little bit easier. And one thing that we don't understand quite as well is why the more complex carbohydrates or high fiber diets are associated with a lower incidence of cancer. But I think it's most likely has to do with the fact that since your body has to work harder to convert that to the nutrients you need, that's why people who eat more complex foods get full with fewer calories. And this is a calorie thing, basically. And so certainly the association, as you said, with simple sugars being more correlated to obesity, we know that many cancers, unfortunately, are associated to that. So that cause and effect remains to be seen. All right. And so then the next step would be the treatment of cancer. So this is one that repeatedly comes up in clinic all the time. You have a patient actively on treatment. And now, like everything, we want to be empowered to have whatever controls possible. And diet is one that could be potentially used. So could the restriction of sugar either somehow improve treatment options and or hasten the sort of growth, if you will? Right. So this is the most complicated and therefore the most important question to ask, because the more straightforward portion of this, which is to tell people to eat a kind of conventionally healthier diet to reduce the risk of developing cancer, but that's already good advice just for life. And it's a more complicated question when a patient has cancer and is receiving treatment. And the primary reason that it's so complicated is because the desire to slow the cancer growth runs smack up against the problem of the person who has the cancer and their ability to recover from these toxic processes. So as you well know, as we both know from seeing patients both in the clinic and the hospital, any intervention to treat cancer is a toxic process that requires healing after. If you get surgery, your body needs to physically heal and knit itself back together. And same thing if you get like radiation therapy. If you get chemotherapy, well, chemotherapy is nothing more than a drug that kills any cell in your body that's dividing. Well, you kill the cancer cells, that's great, but you have some normal cells in your body that need to divide, like the lining of your gut or your hair follicles or your blood products, your red blood cells, white blood cells and platelets, and they need to recover. Well, for them to grow, they also need sugar. And as intriguing as the association between diet and cancer is, one of the first things that we learn as oncology fellows is that the greatest predictor, and I am fairly certain still the greatest predictor of how patients do with chemotherapy or even surgical therapy is what we call their performance status. So how well can they do their daily tasks? And so any dietary modification that would interfere with your ability to be strong enough to tolerate treatment is not going to be a viable strategy. So that's the first and most important thing to get on the table for everybody to understand. The second question is, well, could we move the needle in a smaller way, in a more tolerable way during therapy? And the answer is maybe but there is no hard data to prove anything beyond the recommendations that we would have already had. So we would say it's very reasonable to eat a healthy Mediterranean style complex carbohydrate diet, but we also usually combine that with a companion recommendation, which I have personally heard you tell patients also, which is Chemo makes you not want to eat very much, and it's more important for you to get calories than anything else. So if you hate a Mediterranean diet and the only thing that you can get down is like a 
McDonald's milkshake. You got to do it. Amen. That's absolutely right. Yeah. I had a patient, just a quick anecdote, a very dear patient who had gone onto YouTube and on YouTube, there was this starve your cancer away video. And so the premise was apparently that it was going to be more beneficial to fast for two days before you got your chemo. And unfortunately, her chemo was high dose cisplatin, oh, which no. she hadn't told anybody what she had done. So cisplatin, as you know, can really hurt your kidneys and other things. And she spent almost a week in the hospital because like you said, her normal cells got damaged. Yeah. And so that is not one that we would advocate. And I think you hit it, which is often we have to listen to our body and what we need because we need to keep that fight going right. and to keep that performance status strong. Right. And it helps to, or if it does help to remember, like, as we said before, like these cancer cells will do anything and live on anything to survive. So one way to think about it is like, well, do you think you can outlast your cancer with the two day starve that they, they probably know what to do and can get by scavenging other things, including their dead partner cells right by them. And so harsh starvation diets are more likely to interfere with your ability to tolerate the drugs that we know work or the treatments that we know work than they are to have a toxic effect specifically on your cancer cells. And so I think what I would say to any patient considering anything like this is first and always first talk to your doctor before you make any decisions about how to modify your diet. But a good rule of thumb is to proceed with a diet that you would otherwise consider to be healthy and something that is tolerable if you weren't getting this treatment and to listen to your body, as you said. Talk to me lastly about the ketogenic diet because that's another it. one that's, yeah, you got to talk about it. It always comes up. So for people who haven't heard about it, that the ketogenic diet has mostly been studied as a weight loss mechanism. So essentially the way the ketogenic diet works is this. We have this organ in our bodies called the liver. And the liver, among its many, many jobs, one of them is maintaining a normal sugar level in our blood and figuring out what to do with the extra sugar. And if you have extra sugar, it gives you a kind of a 24-hour backup called your glycogen stores. And then if you have anything in excess of that, it turns it into fat, essentially. And so what the ketogenic diet is, is a diet where you take in very little free sugar, and instead you replace that with either fat or protein. And so protein, as we mentioned before, can be converted to sugar, but it's very expensive for the body to do it. And fats cannot be converted to sugar. And so what happens is that your body burns the fat that you consume for energy. And then it actually burns your body's normal fat stores to supply something called ketone bodies, because your brain is a unique organ that really can only live on a couple of different nutrients. One is glucose or sugar, and the other is this specialized nutrient called the ketone body. And so it turns out that if you restrict the amount of glucose in your diet, you can get your body to burn your fat stores. And so it's an effective way of getting people to lose weight. But because it's a good way to kind of keep excess sugar free of your body, it was a reasonable hypothesis to suggest that it might be an effective cancer therapy. The sustainability of the ketogenic diet is a real problem and the long-term consequences are something that we really don't understand. I know that there are actually some clinical trials ongoing and I think it's really valuable work to be done, but at the same time, would not advise it at all as a strategy to pursue outside because I would say it's as or far more likely to put you in a tough physical position as it is to provide you a benefit that we're not sure even exists. And as you said before, we're an organism. We're not just those cancer cells. So all those other cells that need those healthy nutrients will be starving too. So lastly, when you take it back to the clinic and your live home specialties, what do you tell your patients overall in terms of keeping well and overall health to get through these treatments as it relates not only to nutrition, but overall? I kind of proceed according to what we had talked about before. I say, to the extent that you can tolerate it, a diet that is rich in complex carbohydrates, proteins, a sort of mixed balanced diet. The Mediterranean diet is just one that I happen to like. 
In lymphoma world, of course, we're also a little bit concerned about anything that might be infectious because so many of our patients have extremely low blood counts that put them at risk of infections. So we typically tell them, but I think this is good advice for anybody getting cancer therapy, don't go to an open buffet. Right. That's probably good advice for most of us. <laughs> yeah, honestly, it really is. Avoid deli meats and stuff like that. But we always, always complex it with that. If you're having a hard time with chemo and there are only certain things that you can eat, getting enough calories into your body that you can get yourself up each day and lead as close to what you would consider to be like a high quality of life is more important. It's not just for the physical benefits, but as again, we both know, the process of going through treatment for cancer, whatever setting it's in, whether it's on a specific timeline or it's indefinite, is a mental, emotional, physical Marathon. Slug, marathon. And true. and so maintaining what you consider to be a quality of life is should be a really important priority. So we always encourage that. Absolutely. Thanks so much. It was super informative. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Dr. Santosh Vardana, medical oncologist and scientist. Thank you for listening to Cancer Straight Talk for Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. For more information or to send us any questions you may have, please visit mskcc.org slash podcast. Help other people find this helpful resource by rating and reviewing this podcast at Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcast. These episodes are for you, but are not intended to be a medical substitute. Please remember to consult your doctor with any questions you have regarding medical conditions. I'm Dr. Diane Reedy Lagunes, onward and upward. Okay, let me, oh, oh, hold on, okay. So hi everyone, I hope you enjoyed that. That was very informative, especially for our patient population that <clears throat> want to starve their body of sugar, uh, sugar in the attempt to starve um, cancer cells. So as we all, we've all heard by the ex, from the experts, it's important to have high quality of life during treatment. And part of high quality of life includes um, a good diet, high complex diet that will help the body recover from whatever treatment options that they have selected, uh, they will be getting. So they you all heard in the video, a rich complex carb diet, more protein diet, high fiber diet. In fact, it did recommend a very good Mediterranean diet and patients should avoid um, habits that will expose them like going to open buffets and patients are recommended to avoid daily foods. So usually daily foods here in this country are like usually like um, processed meats that are not cooked. So we don't have that much in Nigeria. So here in the US, we have like um, um, turkey chicken that are cold cut. They're not cooked. So those are referred, to, that's what it referred to as daily meat. So in conclusion, um, in conclusions, when, in conclusion, when the patient is receiving chemo treatment or any form of cancer treatment, we have to de debrief as clinicians. And I believe nurses play a very big role in this because we often are come across the patient, maybe they open up more to the nurses, or even the social work department, the social workers, and also the pastoral care. Communicate with their doctors, with their oncologists, their surgeon, let them know what the fear is. Ask the patient, how are you doing? Despite all this information, treatment options we've thrown at you, and you've started treatment, you're receiving treatment, how is this person doing as a whole? Not just medically, but also psychologically and socially. So it's important for us as clinicians to build a trusting relationship with the patient. And definitely we're gonna be doing a whole lot of work, debunking meat and stigmatization. And part of the meat is what we've heard about the um, sugar and cancer cells. So, I believe if we have a trusting relationship, if we have a listening here to the patient, patients will be able to open more, up more. And one thing that I find to be very important in treatment of cancer is representation in terms of culture, religious, and social belief. I'm not sure if we have chaplaincy incorporated into the medical care in Nigeria, but that's something um, Nigeria is so 
caught up in religious belief. Nothing wrong about that, to believe in a higher being. But as it is now, everything about Nigeria is religion. Religion plays a big, very big role in how a lot of them think. Even modern culture. Many people believe in what their pastor says than more than what their culture has shown them and more than what they've been taught in school and what are, more than what they've been taught in the home. So we have to tap into these resources. Make sure you have chaplains in all the in oncology, oncology trained chaplains that attend training. Let them know about cancer treatments and how patients' relig religious belief interfere with their treatment options. Educate them and use them as resources. When you identify these patients, have um, this mindset and uh, usually, you know, have such beliefs, refer them accordingly. Refer them for pastoral care. Evidence have shown that patients who have higher beliefs and patients who, you know, are religious tend to do, have a good coping mechanism through any situation they're going through. So I believe that we should have a very, we should respect the patient's belief, understand their belief, let them feel comfortable. You can, you know, you can, it's, and patients actually do well when they see people that look like them, sound like them, believe in, have beliefs like them. They feel comfortable opening up and they're actually listening. So it's important for any department, any medical department to have a very robust, trained and skilled social work and interdisciplinary department that will address health disparities across the patient population. Social workers do a phenomenal job because they look at a patient as a whole, they pause and look at the patient. And I can tell you, nurses, assess, the nursing notes should have very detailed assessments where we, can, we should incorporate, um, we should incorporate clinical decision support. Um, we should tap into the technology and um, incorporate the screening tools. If the patient score high, recommend uh, refer them accordingly. And um, I hope that with this, we're able to bridge health disparity among our population. I, um, I, one thing I also want to throw out there is, like I said earlier, there's so many investors in the community that have no knowledge about healthcare, opening up everything to make them money. So there, um, that's one thing you may want to look into as clinicians um, in terms of spam banking and head donation in Nigeria, because I see that IVF is becoming very popular in Nigeria. I, know, I can count more than 10 women I know in the US that have gone to Nigeria for IVF treatment that has been successful. So that's one area you may want to tap in, invest in a very, very, very good interdisciplinary department with um, skilled workers, you know, cl clinicians that have knowledge in oncology, that have training, you know, basic training. They don't need to go to, to, for, to medical school or nursing school. No, just basic training. Let them know in, in the words they understand how cancer cells work and how different, um, how compliance interfere with the treatment option. So with all this, I believe we'll be able to bridge healthcare disparity in Nigeria and hopefully good assessment of quality of life, referral to resources, collaborative care. Collaborative care is extremely important in the success of cancer and chemotherapy treatments, collaborative care. So compliance with treatment and avoid loss to follow up. Loss, loss to follow up is when the patient just don't show up anymore. Stop coming for treatment. You don't know anything about them. They cut you off. They don't pick up your call. And the next thing we know, they have cancer everywhere. So we got to avoid that. And also refer that the goal is to have them in survivorship. And unfortunately for patients who need palliative care, refer them uh, appropriately. So thank you so much for listening to me. These are my references. And now I'm going to take questions. I'm going to turn on my video. And um, Kathleen, can you help us with questions, please? Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation and we're getting lots of really, really wonderful feedback in the, in the chat. So thank you. That was excellent. Um, and yes, I am happy to help field some of these questions. Um, so we have a few, just starting from the top. Um, there's a question about relationship with microwaved food and cancer. I don't know if that was touched on a bit, but if there's anything you'd like to say to that. So um, microwave food and cancer, you know, we don't have enough evidence to show that, but what we do have evidence to show is um, the plate you use to microwave the food. 
plastic plate. So they say avoid using plastic plate. You could look it up. It's the plate that you used to like, um, depending on, people don't read instruction. Most of those plastic says, uh, place says do not microwave but people do not <laughs> people just don't they throw every plate in the microwave so i think um, they actually recommend using pyrex to microwave but you know what if the patient says i don't want to microwave my food it's good 20 30 40 years ago we didn't eat microwave food let them put the food on the pot and microwave their food it's it's okay you know when patients come up with all this meat just let them show them what evidence says and let them know this is what evidence says we, this is what we know but if you feel comfortable now eating food from microwave perfect warm up your food nothing wrong with that so the rate of breast cancer in nigeria is alarming between 20 and 45 yes it's happening here in the u.s too it's not just nigeria the rate of cancer in the world is alarming. And there's so many evidence, um, clinical trials working on, is it the, for women, is it the uh, hormone therapy with the uh, back control? We don't know. So all we know is there's something we're doing that is causing cancer, but we can only give you answers based on what evidence has shown. So as clinicians, we cannot get caught up in the meat. We have to only, give the patient fact based on evidence-based studies. We can tell them, oh, although we've heard about this, but this is what evidence does and show, but if this is what you believe, as long as it does not interfere with your cancer treatment, that's fine. And as long as, long as the, your belief is not alarming or would not be detrimental to your health, that's fine. So breast cancer rate is really popular in America too. Uh, it's among the, the young population. Fertility preservation is not that common because it's not a medical assistant that is readily acceptable, known and affordable, as well as which do you deal with first, the cancer journey of fertility. You have to provide the patient the option of fertility preservation. You have to. Since we don't have the resources in Nigeria, it becomes very challenging, but give them the information. A flyer with, according to the American Cancer, you know, ASCO, provide the information for the patient. Um, but treatment has to commence. But as long as you provide information for the patient, let them know what the challenges are in Nigeria and where they have options for preservation. Let them know. Oh, we don't have it in Nigeria, but we have it in Ghana. We have it in South Africa. Realistic goals for the patient. Don't say, oh, we don't have it in Nigeria, but we have it in the United States. Well, how long is it going to tell get them to take them to get a visa in the United States? Two years waiting list to get a visa appointment. We have to be... We have to be realistic with the patient, okay? But information must be provided to the patient. Get provide information with them, let them know these are your choices, these are challenges in Nigeria, but you have to commence with your treatment. It's important so that your cancer does not spread further than it is already. So communion contraindicates the surgical procedure. Oh, communion. So here is what we do in Sloan. Depend most surgery cases, we do not, if not only no, most um, hospitals, uh, we don't let you eat. you fasting the night before surgery, no food after 12 midnight. No food after 12 midnight, period. Communion is made from what? Carbs, bread, biscuits. You could tell the patient to have their communion the day before. But you can have their doctors come to bless them that morning. If you have a chaplain, so I said the doctor, sorry. You can have the chaplain or the pastoral care, whoever they want, the reverend father, none, anyone available to bless them or their rabbi, bless them right before in the pre-op period before they go into surgery. So we in Sloan actually have them, we have them available. They have an office downstairs and their office is around 24 hours seven. Anytime that my mom is actually a chaplain, she used to work with one of the hospitals and yeah, anytime there's always a chaplain available 24 hours seven. So anything the patient requires, time the patient requests, the chaplain shows up, talks to the patient, prays with the patient. So communion can be, because it's bread, it's food. Most of our patients have to fast, no food after 12 midnight, but they're allowed to have water up until two hours before the time of arrival. Does that answer your question? Okay, so next question. Cancer is not a death sentence and the management is like taking malaria. So as healthcare professional, we must instill confidence, positive mind, very intrepid. From the first day I was diagnosed with breast cancer, I had a positive mind. Oh, congratulations on survivorship 
So if you want to, I don't know if you have support groups where you can create, you can start Juliet. You can start a support group for women with breast cancer so that they know they can hear it firsthand from somebody who's been there. Let them know how spirituality helped you through your treatments and you were able to couple your spirituality with your chemotherapy treatment without fear. So you, you, know, you should be a great resource for other women dealing with this. Congratulations on survivorship. Nigeria is really over, overly religious. It's shameful. Oh, Lord. <laughs> it's shameful. I'm sorry. I'm Nigerian. But the things I hear kills me. And it that has nothing to do with education. It's sad. Nigerians are very educated and forced to just, I don't know. I cannot judge. It's hard. I cannot judge. I cannot judge a patient based on their religious belief. And as clinicians, we should not just, just refer them. Like I said, your hospital should invest in very good chaplain departments. We have so many pastors. There's a church on every street in Nigeria. Just make sure they are well-trained chaplain. They have, um, they get the master's and the doctorate degree for chaplaincy and pastoral care. As long as they are trained with uh, chaplaincy and pastoral care, you can send them through training, like just a two-day, three-day training and hire them. I don't know if the facility has a lot, a lot of money, but I believe because Nigeria is so religious, you should incorporate pastoral care into your, you know, make the resources available for the patients. And it has to be people who are educated, not just anyone who just went to, who, who just opened a church without an education. So they have um, people who go to school for master's in divinity. I know my mom has that. Then she has a PhD in counseling or something. Yeah, so they have a lot of them. Like, you know, a lot of them come from Nigeria. They go, my, I remember when my mom was in school here in Colombia, there were a lot of people from Nigeria living in Nigeria that came for the program. So I think we should tap into that resources. Okay, next question. Congratulations. Oh, Obioma, I'm sorry to hear about your mother-in-law on chemo. You need to support her through treatments. You have to be there for her, hold her hands, let her know if she's fearful of anything to communicate with you, provide only information that evidence-based for her. Don't all oh, these meets, you have to help her. Now you have to be a rock in debunking this meet and meets about cancer. So I hope, I pray, and I, you know, Nigerians, we are very religious. I pray your mom goes through, your mother-in-law goes through chemo successfully and she goes into remission. Okay, and I think it looks like there's about two more in the chat and we can maybe finish with these last two. Um, maybe this is, I know we've touched on this a bit, but one of them is what usually increases the cancer burn among our African countries. I think it's not just in Africa, it's worldwide. Cancer is becoming a, is, is a worldwide com, com, problem. It's not, mm -mm, mm -mm. it's not just African countries. No, I don't think so. It's worldwide and there's so many clinical trials and research going on to find out what's going on. So, but we can see, you know, the only thing we can infer is based on 50 years ago, we have now have more technology, more, we have ad advancement in everything. So we don't, we don't have any evidences to show that, but we can see the difference in the life we live in now, especially for those of you that have lived longer than I am, people that have been around about, you know, I'm, I'm in my forties. I remember when I was a child, things are so much more different. So yeah, it's a worldwide problem. No, you should never hide anything from any patient. Be truthful, be honest. I'll tell you this. If you do this in the USA, you will get sued. No, I don't know about what Nigeria does, but I'll tell you, I had a patient who passed away last year. I was actually was the one, you know, a friend, a family friend. She passed away from breast cancer. And till the time of her death, I didn't even know what her, her stage was. The doctors didn't tell her, they didn't release the information too. I think it's a practice in Nigeria. She's a pastor, she actually was a pastor. She was a pastor. Because of that, she ended up with late diagnosis. She sent me a picture of her breast. And I was like, no, this doesn't look good. Immediately, I saw the breast. I sent her for mammogram. She had a biopsy. She started treatment. She gave up on treatment. And till the time of her death, her husband did not know the stage of her cancer diagnosis. So everything happened within a span of three, three months. So I don't think, please do not hide. Let them know. You know why you should let them know. 
Let them share their diagnosis with their first degree relatives so that they can start screening early. It's important. It's very important. So one thing Nigerian do, Nigerians do is we high diagnosis. And we're not helping anyone. You're not helping your cousins. You're not helping your children. They need to know that you have cancer so they can start screening at a younger age to prevent, you know, to prevent um, advanced stage uh, diagnosis. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was such a wonderful presentation. And we're so, so thankful to have you with us today. Um, before we do a final wrap up, I want to invite Gloria Uglu from um, Project Pink Blue to unmute and turn on their camera and just oh, okay. say a couple of words if possible. Gloria, are you able to turn on your camera? Hello, Gloria. Hi. Uh, hello, Caitlin. Hello, this is Gloria. She's a, a program coordinator at Project Pink Blue, who is the organization delivering this, this training and just had a couple of words. Thank you, Gloria. Go ahead. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, a very big thank you to, to our presenter. Um, this is such an insightful presentation, honestly. And it's so, it's so self-explanatory that um, anybody, whether you are health personnel or not, you are sure that you understand what she's saying. And I think that is, that is wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Kathleen, for setting up this, you know, for helping us you know in all the support to put in as 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 partner to make sure that this comes to fruition i would not take it for granted and a very big thank you to everybody that joined you know we know that um in nigeria this is past work time and so we understand that some people have been many people need to stay back uh in their office to you know uh use what use uh, data or to be in a place you know many people are going to stay back at work to attend this um this webinar and it just shows how much they appreciate um what we do and what we are bringing to them so thank you very very much to to all of you for attending thank you so much the nurse we really appreciate this um i'm sure because um as someone who works in the cancer space as an advocate and then as a patient as well, I understand uh, you know, what it means to want to go in for chemotherapy and you have very little information. So a lot of people have very little information about the drugs they want to take, about the side effects, about how it's going to affect them, about, about so many things. Like me, I, I, I found out with the treatment, all of this information, doctors, and nurses sometimes they give you very little information and then you just have to find out what's going to happen to you or some of us resource to internet and you know all the information on the internet is not always right so um i think this is a call to every nurse or doctor to everyone you know it's not just a nurse or doctor um Role. It's everybody's role, you know, to make sure they counsel, right counsel to cancer patients, you know, um, counsel that is verified, that is true, so that, you know, you are better informed, you're better prepared to face what is ahead of you. So I think this is a very, very timely um, lecture, and I want to say a very, very big thank you to, to everybody here today. Thank you so much. So our partners, BVGH, a very big thank you to Act Foundation. Act Foundation is, uh, is the founder of this project of great oncology. Um, thank you to BVGH that been working with us since last year, you know, to organize these trainings. And thank you so much to, to, to the nurse. Sorry, I, I, I keep forgetting your name. I don't know if it's- Oh, Tara. Tara. Call me Tara. Tara. I just forget a lot these days. I don't know. I'm Tara, sorry. that's fine. Yes, thank you so much, Tara. Thank you so, so much for this insightful, simplified lecture. Honestly, I've learned a lot. Thank you so much. You. Yes, thank you to everyone. And um, see you on the 8th for the next lecture. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Thank, thank you, you, Alan. We'll be sending follow-up email um, with links to the recording, the slides, and also all of the uh, wonderful links Omatara showed from the MSKCC website as well. So we'll be following up with that shortly. Thank you all so much.
Thank you, Gloria. Thank you, Amatara. Kathleen, is there, a way, is there a way I can type the links here for them or attach the file? Um, I'll, well, everyone who's joined today, I'll be able to send them the links afterwards. Thank you all so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. I'm, I'm responding so to, um, to, to look, look on our site and resources. Okay. Um, cancer Society. Okay. Tons of I think if that answer come through. Yeah, sorry. No, of course. Thank you for tuning in. I really genuinely appreciate it. Thank you for having me. So can I just end the call? Yes, I'll go ahead and end it. Thank you all. Have a wonderful night. You too, bye. Bye.